Are you crying? <laughs> Maybe. Shit. Are you crying for Tony's game? Yeah, Tony's game. It is just, sad. Just, Wait, what? Just sad. Don't be sad. I mean, it's just... Uh, it's like a pity party on there, and I just can't help but weep. <laughs> oh. It's like, I'm 20 over. After two 84 holes. yesterday, boys. 84 yesterday. It's coming oh, back. Front line. No, I, I was actually... On the back, I was even through five on the back, and then just kind of like it was fucking raining, and even the rain gloves weren't working. So, are you playing tomorrow? Uh, yeah, there's a tournament tomorrow, and then I'll play on Sunday as well. And I'm gonna go take a lesson Monday, and then Tuesday I'm leaving on a jet plane. So when when it comes when it comes to a tournament, do you did your bum like clench up and get squeaky bum, or do you let loose? Uh, well, I'm gonna try not to give a fuck. How about that? Yeah, because if not, I'll uh, I'll have this really small violin over here on Twitter. Well, the upside is at least I can putt. So true. <laughs> but <laughs> oh damn, he just came at your neck. <laughs> I can't putt and shoot, shoot three under. No, no. So that's a, that's the depressing. So thing So if for we you. put you two together, what would you shoot? I don't know, fucking tag me in on the putting green. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony. Harry, Sam, welcome to No Putts Given episode 18 Today we got Dean Snell. He's cutting straight through the bullshit in the golf ball industry today. We got a company coming to America that you're definitely going to want to pay attention to. And Titleist is doing Titleist things. Let's get it. Oh yeah. No Putts Given is powered by My Golf Spy, the most extensive reviews in golf. Before you buy, My Golf Spy. Nine million readers do it every year. Check us out. Give me just a second here. Just got an email from Puma. <laughs> so Wait a second, we I gotta listening. see what my script says for Puma. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me you a script. Wore la- You're, you wore that last week. <laughs> yeah, we need to get the whole full line in. Come on. That's that's a Mizuno hat. <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question real quick. You know, uh Bryson DeChambeau is playing some new supposedly graphite oh. shaft in his irons that supposedly can tell the difference between <laughs> wet and dry conditions. The shaft? The shaft, no. How do it know? Will not. I, think, I will not know. He presses the button and say, "Oh, it's wet." It's like it's How like a woman. Know? It's like a woman when they when they yeah. say and they get tender boobs or stiff. Wait a second. Oh, All right, cut this. Like, what Whoa. in the hell are you talking <laughs> <Hold> about, <on. laughs> Tony? What is the difference? How does a shaft know between wet and dry conditions? Yeah, I think it, I I hope it was just one of those things where he went was free form talking and just <sighs> sentences jumbled together and implied one thing that he doesn't actually believe because. To, to sort of suggest that a shaft improves the consistency of ball flight in wet conditions is, yeah, you're not going to find a lot of support for that idea from uh, anybody who's ever engineered anything in the golf world. What so is, what is yeah. the shaft? It's, yeah, so it's LA Golf Partners, you know, LA Golf Shaft. Mm-hmm. It's called Rebar. Super, super duper stiff graphite is probably what I assume I'm like that, especially with his wedges. Bryson is has been doing that for a while going stiffer and heavier to kind of offset right if you've ever tried a one length iron when you get into that nine iron and that pitching wedge that that thing just wants to get up in the air because of the extra length here's the thing man i don't know bryson's not wrong very often i mean things that he finds we find in testing a lot of times right so hey you never know maybe there's a button on the shaft like harry said that you say all right conditions are wet (laughs) It just it's like a transformer. It just transforms into something completely but what, different. But but I'm trying to think of it and I know we're just kind of joking around, but from a technical side, like how do you even we're we're doing the wet wedge test and I'm like, how how do you even you, it's hard enough for a golf club company to to move water off the face of a golf club when the No, is it wet. is it a wet condition? Well, yeah, so is I, it like wet ground, wet ball, wet face, or is it like raining? <laughs> So this is this is where I'm guessing it was sort of like this world salad, word salad kind of misspeaking kind of thing. So Theoretically, right, the reason he would be switching to a shaft like this is just sort of more consistency across the board, right? Like he just delivers it the same every time. And so if you're if you're more consistent in your delivery, you're going to be more consistent in your ball flight regardless of conditions. But the way kind of the quote was worded sort of hinted that he was saying that it, it's more consistent in wet and dry conditions and, you know, theoretically – based on anything that I know or anybody I've ever spoken to knows your the shaft really isn't going to improve consistency in wet conditions above and beyond like just the fact that he's more consistent in general. 
How about that? All right. Can well, we give him that? I'll give him that. You know. <clears throat> anyway, we weren't planning on starting with that, but we had to because I just forgot that there was a shaft out there that knew the difference between... It's a pretty you. cool name, I think. Uh, rebar? Rebar? I love the name. I thought ultra stiff graphite shaft right when I heard it, so good job, LA Golf Shafts. I, w- I would have thought steel as rebar tends to be steel, but okay. Hey, but if you're going to rename graphite into the yeah. steel game and replace steel, replace it with rebar. Damn right. Well, right. here's... Here, I think kind of the bigger piece, right? And, and John Wall, Jonathan Wall mentioned this uh, in his tweet, like Bryson conceivably could be 14 clubs. It probably is, right? All 14 clubs graphite this week, right? Um, which is on the PGA Tour basically unheard of. And we've kind of talked about the, the TPT iron shaft that they've been kicking around for you know, quite a while now and that we're hearing it's probably going to be, you know, 20, 2020 release, but this idea like, Hey, we, we may finally have a graphite iron shaft that people on tour think is viable and can kind of remove the stigma around graphite shaft for better high swings plate, high swing speed players, whatever you want to call it. Right. This idea that graphite is only for seniors and slow swing speed players trying to get rid of that, open up graphite for the masses, the gearhead, the hardcore guys, um, it's not going to matter because here's the problem. Like, I think they will eventually solve the iron graphite game to where it's almost as good or better than steel. But the problem is there's eight clubs in a set and eight times $7 for steel shaft equals X, right? Eight times $50 equals a shit ton more money. And when you relate that back to a game that the equipment is getting more expensive, it just adds another layer of cost that the average golfer doesn't think it's worth the money to pay for and i don't think that's going to change ever unless they get the cost down and everything in in golf is, is small gains right you you pay a lot to get a little and you mentioned 50 dollars a shaft for graphite no 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 when we start when we talk you know maybe that's kind of some of what the the recoil stuff was but what tpt for example which is really hoping to tackle that that tour market they're they're substantially more than a $50 upcharge. All right, so let's take a uh, sub-70 set of irons, complete set, fully built. It's going to cost less than just the eight TPT shafts or probably yeah, rebar shafts yeah, 500 beans yeah. for a full in a whole set, set of irons. Yeah. It's just it's not it's not going to transition <laughs> well to the average consumer. But anyway. Niche, niche market, right? Yeah, and, for sure. You know, what, what happens if, if, and we're thinking way out here in theoreticals, but let's say TPT has a viable shaft that actually performs for better players. Or, or LA golf shafts, right? Let, they're working on one. I don't know what the retail price is that going to be is going to be when when rebar hits the market. But if you have a, a brand like PXG, right, which is already positioned in that premium off market, and says, "Hey, all right, yeah, we'll we'll throw these in for for just a hundred dollars more a stick," <laughs> you know, may, maybe that finds an audience. What and, is the cost? Again, of, what's eight hundred bucks when you're spending? 3, what's the cost of a PXG set at that point? Uh, I mean, so figure what. Do you want to do black ones too? Should we? Should I think we I think Randy from Fried Eggs could sell his Accord and still not buy the set of PXGs. <laughs> Does he still have yeah, Accord? I, <laughs> I think I think you're you're five six thousand a set at that oh point. So just for the <laughs> irons. Yeah. Hey, that Honda Accord, Randy. Can't Jeez, have mode. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to the next topic, and that's kind of a trip that we just went on, and an article that just got published about a company called Enesis Golf. Uh, owned by Decathlon. And when we said that there's a company coming to America that you're going to want to pay attention to, this is the one we're talking about. So basically, if you imagine Dick Sporting Goods of France, that's kind of what this is in a simple analogy. But in reality, it's something drastically different, in my opinion. Um, they are coming to America. Already have a store in San Francisco, yep. right? Yep. yep. And then they're going to be... Seven, expen- what, three, right? Yeah, they three have more in the Bay Area, one. I believe. And they've put those up in the last six months ballpark. So they're planning on spreading their wings really quickly in the U.S. And why it matters, you know, for the average guy that goes in and buys golf equipment from Dick's, the experience is, you know, to be honest, not very good for a serious golfer. You know, rarely is there anybody even in the golf department to help you. If he is, (laughs) he doesn't even play golf sometimes. Uh, The last time we were there, they kicked my kids off the putting green um for putting you know yeah. um, the simulator <laughs> lights are always off yeah i mean so not the best experience right and why i bring that up is Enesis, while it is the quote-unquote dick sporting goods of france does 
a incredible job of creating an experience, right? So I guess the best way to juxtapose this for people to understand, at least from what my value, the value I think this company provides is a lot of companies start off being about, you know, the people, right? The consumer, the customer. And once they transition to fully becoming a bottom line profit company, it's really hard to go back and go, yeah, we really give a shit about the consumer and customer. You can say that, but there are plenty of OEMs that I've seen, you know, no need to really name them. You probably can name them on your own and go, yeah, I don't really think they care about the customer anymore. All they're doing is pumping out product, pumping out product. And it becomes about profits over the people. And this company, so, I mean, it's one of the most impressive interactions I've ever had in the time I've been with Mike Ospi and when we learned about who they were, their ethos and philosophy based on their company, right? Yeah. And it was refreshing as hell to listen to. And they weren't bullshitting. I mean, what they said, they meant, and they back it up with, you know, what they do. So Sam just visited the Ennis's, I don't know what you want to call that. What are you, the golf the park, golf correct? Park, yeah, they have this massive golf park in Lille, France. It's in the northern end of France. And they've got literally everything from a retail space where they can sell you the product, but they've also got their entire team there. So they've got R&D, marketing, consumer experience. Everything is in this one house. They've got their design lab. And then they've even got a six-hole golf course, a three-hole golf course, putting and chipping. They've got, it's literally a golf park where you can have, every, they even have a restaurant where you can have lunch. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, and while that sounds really cool and yeah. it's a cool experience, there's a purpose behind that, right? right? So it's to be able to have everything in one environment. The designers are all in one area. They throw the products that they're, mm-hmm. you know, 3D modeling off to golfers and off to people to they go test right them. right out the back door and test it right on the golf course. And that's that's the really unique experience about Decathlon as a whole is that it's not just Innesis either. It's all of their brands. So their, their mountain store is in the mountains and their backyard is their test ground. Yeah, so how we came to learn about this company was as organic as I guess you can get. I mean, basically, we saw their shoe. They showed us a shoe, and we went, eh, big deal. And then we put it on and, and tested it and went, Well, we, we saw it, and it was like, ah, uh, just an everyday cheap. It looks cheap. It does look cheap. So I think it looks we, good. I was like, meh. Nah. From afar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I was like, kind of the Skechers problem. Good. Yeah, kind yeah. of in a, in a way, but it, it's in my opinion probably a little bit less fashionable than sketches. Um, <laughs> you think it, so? It, it, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I would disagree with that. But Brutal. I'm no well, well here's the problem expert. with Skechers. That big S stamped on the side tells people, "Dude, you're wearing Skechers, yeah. right?" With Enesis, they've got enough color palettes and things like that to go. Oh, that's pretty cool. Like that red one that they had looks cool. The white black combo yeah. looks pretty cool. Nevertheless, we put on the shoe, and up to this date, it is still the most mm-hmm. comfortable rated shoe we've ever tested. Yeah. So we knew they were onto something, and then we thought, all right, we've got to learn more about this product and then this company and then what else they do. And then they did a rangefinder that was really good. But then we learned about their philosophy on how they go about making equipment and then selling that equipment. And when you walk into their stores, one of the coolest things I ever heard from a retail standpoint, which is a total 180 compared to how the U.S. market sells golf equipment is, you walk in and they quickly kind of identify, all right, you beginner, intermediate, or advanced, right? right? If you're a beginner, you go to this section of the golf shop, this or this, Mm -hmm. right? And there's totally different products for what level you are as a golfer. And that's something we've kind of preached for a long time. So 43-inch drivers for beginners, not 46-inch and these crazy million different options. They simplify it for the average golfer, you know, they, they build the products for the actual type of golfer you are, which is a cool philosophy. Well, and I think one of the interesting things is, is they come at it from a different angle where they, they understand that beginner golfers won't really know what to look for, whereas I feel like in some companies in America, they take advantage of that. So they're saying, okay, well, you don't, know, you don't even know what you need to buy, so let's just sell you the most expensive shit. Well, once again, that's the thing I loved about them. So they put the consumer first, right. and that's one of our hashtags, right? Consumer first, and they don't put the profits first, right? And it's so much more about building the relationship with the customer than it is about just selling them a product. You know, From each point in this buying process, they're, they're attempting to put the best performing products for your skill level in your hands so that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, the money will come eventually because over the, the consumer life cycle, they're going to stick around and they're going to know that they can trust the brand rather than just, well, oh, well, they just sold me product. Well, take it like this. Like, 
they take recreation and the experience very seriously, right. right? And if you are serious about recreation, whether it be golf or whatever it is, you take that serious and then you experience a good experience with that company, you're more likely to work with that company again, right? Right. So or, if I'm a beginner, I'm going to go in, I'm going to start with the 100 series and then I might improve enough to say, hey, okay, well, I liked my 100 irons. Maybe I'll move into the intermediate section once my handicap hits a certain level and you can you can build a... a, a rapport i guess with with the consumers really easily with this kind of model yeah that's a good point it's, and go ahead Tony. it's 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 a different when you think about it right with with the Cathalon and and the innocence brand that that's their focus right is on their in-house brand that that they developed so that that gives them a little more flexibility to, to say hey we're we're selling our stuff for the beginner and we've got our intermediate and we've got our advanced corner whereas modern sort of u.s retail it's like are you a tailor-made guy? Well, go to the tailor-made corner. If you're a Callaway guy, go to the Callaway corner. If you're a Titleist guy, go to the Titleist corner. And if you're a guy who's who's really just kind of new to the game and a real, a true beginner, like you probably haven't figured that piece out yet, right? Yeah, you're just a, you're just a golfer. And right, or yeah, or even, I mean, to an extent, right, a guy who wants to become a golfer. <laughs> there you go. And, and you don't know where to go because you're like, well, you know, which, which logo is cool versus well, which yeah. product is designed to meet yeah, my needs. Yeah, think about how confusing it is if you want to go, like, we've obviously been golfers, so we don't think about this. But let's say you, somebody convinces you to become a golfer and you go, man, like, I want to become a golfer. And you walk into a regular retail store, overwhelming. Yeah. You know, paralysis. Well, it is, and then analysis. you're looking at the price tag and you're like... I might be giving this up in six six months. I'm not going to spend, you know, two grand on a full set right right off the bat. I can go to a beginner. I'm not sure what Indices there's have. A, there's a wall thrown up right away. Massive. Versus yeah. the decathlon model, which is like, hey, you want to start out? Here's an affordable option for you to at least get started. And it's in a way that helps you enjoy the game quicker. Meaning, yeah. I think the keys to growing golf are fairly simple. And it happens... There's three things I think that help grow the game, and the faster these three things happen, the more likely that you're going to have a, a a golfer for life, and that is hitting the sweet spot. No different than when you hit a home run and you feel that feeling. Mm -hmm. If you can hit the sweet spot, get a par, and get a birdie, the quicker those three things happen, the more likely someone, in my opinion, is going to become a golfer. Absolutely. Right. So I think Innesis does a great job at that because if you're selling people products that can help them do those things quicker. I mean, hey, play a shorter hole. Well, Do yeah, it with 43 inch drivers. Even golf park around that, though, they have a six hole pitch and putt course where you can go on, and it's it's literally like a par three course, but the longest hole might be 80 yards or 100 yards. Yeah, and if you're a new golfer and you're playing a par three that's 210, yeah. right, versus 90 yards, yeah. you're a new golfer, you don't care. And and they've created a culture where, and I don't know if this is just because it's Europe or because it's France or because it's a Cathlon and Innesis, but they've created a culture where you feel welcomed at the golf course. I feel like a lot of people when they're beginner golfers, I, you see this a lot with the gym, people that don't know how to work out. Like they won't go to the gym unless they have somebody to show them work out because they're embarrassed to be around other people that know how to work hey man, out. That's a fact. Like take buff, you know, yeah. our friend, um, his son was serious. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> hey, don't. Have I got a story for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, Buff son was serious about taking up golf, you know, and he would go to go, all right, I want to take my son out. And the first thing they would say is like, they didn't want him to play on the right. course. And he's like, dude, I'm a member of this course and I want to teach my son how to play. There's not a great option for that, right? right. Par three, shorter holes. They're a great option to have kid be able to just go over there, have some fun, get a solid shot, get a par, get a, even if it's a fake birdie, you know, yeah. they feel like then they can actually play this game. And once they feel like they can actually play it, they're more likely. Well, it is a little bit different. I mean, in England, there is obviously those clubs that are the same over here, the country club kind of vibe, and they have a thing called a junior section where you don't have to be a member. You just come up there and that gets a, get a group lesson, which is inviting. Um, but it still has a stigma of atta attached to it, where if you're if if you're like a, a kid and you're probably like a twenty handicap trying to get into the game. There's still out guys out there be like, oh, this is going to be a slow round. They yeah. don't know anything. Um, they're just going to annoy my rounder before they even tee off. So there's right. still that. And then if it's like, if someone says something, and I've had this um, done to me when I was a junior, if someone says, you you need to speed up or you need to do better at this or whatever it was, I can't quite remember, it knocks my confidence. I was like, I don't want to go back. 
I don't want to see that guy again. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's the same. You feel self conscious. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, then, and that's not how to grow the game to make the first no. experience come to a course and go, man, I'm not, I do not feel wanted here. But know? I do think that the, that breed is, you know, dying off. It's more like I experienced this recently with going back to my home club. We got stuck behind some juniors and they were taken forever. But I was thinking, like, man, that was me 10, 15 years ago hitting, you know, 10 shots on a par four, not knowing that, like, I was that bad. Yeah. But for me to be able to say, okay, that was me one day, I understand. And, like, we were patient. But I've been in situations where I've been that kid and been, oh, God. Guys have driven up on me. Get the hell off the golf Learning course. Learning golf for me doing? was the worst experience. <laughs> I mean, was the worst experience, man. My dad wanted me to play so bad, but he felt that pressure urge from behind, you know, yeah. the group behind. So it was just a, you know, hit a shot, run, race, get to the next shot. And yeah. it's like, dude, is this golf? Like, this is not fun, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I don't play golf anymore. So there you go. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> I am Thank playing next Friday. So, <laughs> so you are not playing next Friday? I am playing next Friday. Wait, really? It's, it's a verbal contract that's binding yeah, We have Virginia. it on camera now. <laughs> yes. I am playing next Friday. Let's go. We're going to win. Let's get We're going to get some cocktails. All right. So <laughs> just to wrap it up, Ennis's so far, go check him out. You know, obviously we wrote an article about Chris them did, yesterday. That was a great write-up from Chris. Really good write-up really yesterday. That. Uh, that really kind of describes it perfectly, you yeah. know, of what the company is and their purpose. But that being said, so far, just in our own testing, they've done well with Shoes. the range finder, the shoe, and the golf the ball, ball um, yeah. at a very affordable price. And speaking of golf balls... We're going to get to our next uh, section on new releases, and that is Titleist doing what Titleist does, and that's called the EXP-01. And uh, let me ask you guys questions. Um, have you ever gotten one of those blank white boxes in the mail from Titleist? We can't stop getting them. Did you get them before you started working for MySkog? Oh, uh, no. Not no? that way. Did you? No, no. When I was always jealous when I would see it on Instagram. People would be popping up with white boxes. I'm like, where's my white box? I know. Right, so like the white box, like Titleist kind of invented that, yeah. right? That's cool. for team Titleist guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you gotta unless join you're the team, team Titleist, you don't you oh, don't how, get the white box. How did I get on team Titleist? Do you think do you I, think this will be a you're my a new spy. a new thing? This was prior. You think so? They got white boxes for golf balls. Do you think it'll be clubs coming in white boxes? I think and his hats. Do you think Tony's gonna come in a white box? Tony <laughs> white box hat. Yeah, white box hat. Be good. Hope so. <laughs> the thing about balls that makes it easy is like you just don't put a logo on it, so you don't know what's on the inside. With a club, you can't just like not put a logo on a club because it's right in front of yeah, you. Yeah, you know? can. What Prototype. Do you, mean? you just just slap slap it on this cast iron. Well, Shaft. the thing um, is, clubs aren't made out of cast well, iron. Well, you know really. what I mean. Iron. <laughs> the, Called iron. That is a Duh. skillet. Not <laughs> <golf>. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, no, definitely. I, I think I think if a, a golf company was going to make a driver out of cast iron, it should definitely white box it. Uh, <laughs> it would be a little heavy to ship, though. No. Uh, try playing that thing. Oh boy. My anyway, game. So, off. so most of us now by this point have gotten a white box from Tyus or been jealous or seen, seen it, him, right? Yeah. And yeah. this is kind of taking the white box thing to the next level. So. Tony, what is this? Is this marketing or what? What is this? A little, a little, some marketing for sure. Yeah, and and some experimental, experimental stuff too. So yeah, it's being built is is straight from the R and D lab, right? A new ball called EXP01, the EXP standing, I, I suppose, for experimental. So it's it's the first in what could prove to be a long series of experimental balls that. Titleist is willing to put in consumer hands for the low, low price of thirty nine ninety nine a dozen. Uh, that's, you know, that's map. You can actually apparently buy them for more and then pay shipping on top of it. So, you know, not a groundbreaking deal, but the idea is you get to sample new technology before it's available on the mass market. So, so let me, this let me is, ask again, you a question. first one. If sure. You're, if you're Callaway or Strixon or Bridgestone, obviously they know you're going to be buying those balls and cutting them up and doing a composition test on them or whatever, right? They're most time the the majority of the time companies want to keep things like that uh new tech really close to the vest and not let others see what they're working on right why are they willing to do that with these in your opinion i, w- I would guess two things one it's probably you know not as far along as a typical white box ball but they they have a pretty good idea of what it is right so they're you know it's not halfway done or something like that for the most part and the other piece is i'd be willing to bet it's it's got plenty of patents around it anyway uh, so, and in this case, it's just, uh, it seems like it's a, 
a, the big selling point, right, is a, what they call MTR urethane or something. So something like that. So a, a new urethane formulation for the cover. How'd you get your hands on them? I was going to say, are we going to get some? Do they just randomly send them to random golf? What's that guy addresses? you got fit from at Titleist that has to give them to you? No. So, I mean, I, I got it like I get Glenn? most anything else where, yeah, no, it wasn't Glenn. <laughs> I had a phone call and they said, hey, here's what we're working on. Um, here's all the information for for a story if you want to write one and, you know, we're going to send them to you. Primarily, like, I get that stuff primarily for photos and to mess around a little bit with. So, right. you know, taking them out to the course, out onto the, my backyard, I think, probably more telling than anything else. So, so you've hit yeah, them, Tony. Thanks. Tell us what you know so far or what you think so far about the ball. So if I had to posit a guess as to what we're dealing with, I think this is probably a next generation of technology that will find its way into something like an AVX. We've come, we've seen the cut opens. Matt can probably put them up and put them on the screen for us at some point. But um, it is three-piece construction in line with AVX or Pro V1X or Pro V1 rather. Super soft feel, especially on wedges. Um, you know, hitting it side by side with Pro V1 and Pro V1X noticeably softer does softer does tend to to want to get up in the air a little bit more even off like a a short wedge shot so that that's kind of my biggest observations so far Interesting. how do they do with smiley faces yeah i i i, I have not cut any open on accident <laughs> so accidentally on purpose yeah, yeah no i don't no, I'm, uh, not, I'm betting on Tyler's not releasing a ball that has that problem uh, I, yeah. I could probably go with that Think statement. Bank on That's that. a safe yeah. bet. That is the kind of shit Titleist has tight and locked down and together. So, yeah, you won't see that. All right. So, uh, other than that, wrapping up, uh, no putts given today before we get Dean Snell on here, and that is wedge testing finishes up. Yeah. Right? We have one last session to go. One last session. To I go. have been busy. <laughs> so one last session to go, and we will be putting together the 2019 yeah. most wedge test. I'm already starting to look at the data, so it's but it's, it's coming it, together faster than I thought it would. There's some scary things that I've just been observing once doing the test. Oh god, yeah. With watching and performing the test myself, it is alarming. Okay, so there you go. You heard it right here first. Though there's some alarming issues with wedges, wet versus dry. You mean? Just or, the wet portion in general from yeah. what I've seen. From wet to wet, from iron to, uh, to wedge to wedge. It's yeah. kind of a scary realization <clears throat> that I spin my driver more than some of these wedges. All I can when say they is get wet, you mean. hydrophobicity yep. is real. Yeah. Like that's a real thing. So you're definitely going to want to check out uh, probably two weeks before that comes out, I think. Uh, I doubt we'll have it ready f to publish next week. So for probably the Monday after next. So two weeks yeah. from, uh, you know, two Mondays from now, uh, 2019 Most Wanted Wedge. You're definitely going to want to check this one out because it will be the first time that I think anyone's done a full wet versus dry with all the wedges head to head. So looking forward to seeing what that result uh, looks like. But for all those fans out there, we got a great one coming out for you on Tuesday. What we got? Which is the ball retriever. So oh. you're welcome. <laughs> hey, <laughs> are handles a part of the ball retriever yes, they protocol? Are. Yes, they are. I knew they would be. Handle yeah, Tony, Tony loves that portion. Jesus so, Christ. <laughs> can you give us any kind of teaser around a ball retriever? Because I know they are dying in anticipation to know more information about the ball. Oh, yeah. Well, well, let's face it. I think they have a funnel system, Tony. You'll like this one. So if when the water gets trapped inside the uh, tube that extends, it comes out the bottom of it. Oh, so there you go. You there's can... there's your solution for your umbrella shit. For the umbrella. Bingo. It's all coming together. Does coming the company together. that together. makes the ball retriever also make umbrellas? They should. Yes, they do. Oh, really? Boom. I think so, yeah. License that, Jenks. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. I think they do, but don't quote me on that. Okay. But yeah, but it does get on you because I didn't realize it came out the bottom until it actually spilled on me. So <laughs> we need, you need a funnel system that comes all the way out towards you. It goes around your bag. So do we system. have a definitive winner? Yeah, it's, it's... It's not even close. Nah. Really? There's It's the same family. I'm just going to put that one out there. A blowout in the ball retriever category <laughs> 2019. There's not many to story test. of the year. That is... Because the be. article, that and the speakers. I mean, Tony loves this shit. 